Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. Uh, we are celebrating Black History Month, and the theme this year is African Americans and the Arts. So we have the absolute pleasure of talking with Ashley Walden, who is the founder of several businesses. The one we want to talk mostly about today is the National Black Women's Creative Cooperative. She's the founder and the current president. Good morning, Ashley. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being on and taking our time and getting up early in the morning. Where are you now? Where are you located? I am based in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, okay. Okay, I keep wanting to put you in California for some reason or another. And That's because I lived there for five years and I went to CalArts. That's why. Okay. 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 So where did you grow up and what kind of education did you get? So I'm from a small town called Ahoski, North Carolina. Um, so shout out to all my North Carolina folks who are listening. How out do you here spell today. that? Ahoski. A H O S K I E. Okay. So is that Native American? Ahoski? Yes. Yeah, it's indigenous and it's apparently the one and only. So I'm from that um, small town. It is known um, for having a history of free people of color. So I, I think it's an interesting town. I, I didn't know how interesting it was until I moved out, but I grew up there and it's a community um, where all my family, uh, the majority of them um, still live there. My mom and dad's family. I have a huge family. I literally have like a hundred cousins. So my okay. dad comes from a big family <laughs> and my mom comes from a very big family. So I cannot visit the town without running into someone that I'm related to. And then I um, went to undergrad at Old Dominion University, and I studied theater. And I went to graduate school in Los Angeles at the California Institute of the Art, where I studied um, theater producing. Because it turned out that I was a little bit better at bossing people than acting. <laughs> 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 that is how I got into arts management, stage management, but all things business and behind the scenes for um, creative studies. Um, so... With my work, though, I always knew I wanted to do art that had an impact, not just art for art's sake, being from a community um, and, you know, being raised uh, by black folk. And, you know, that's that's my heart. I wanted to make sure that my work had meaning and impact just from the time I started out my career. OK, so you like to tell people what to do. My son would say so. <laughs> your son, your mom, your dad, your <laughs> significant others, and yeah, okay. <laughs> it, it, it's it's um, a lot of black women have that telling people what to do. Yes, yeah. Okay, so you went to school. Let's talk about your work. Where did you start working at? Okay, well, I want to go back and say a lot of black women have that skill because it's a management skill. And I will, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the co-op. So the National Black Woman Creative Co-op is a worker-owned limited liability co-op um, for mutual aid for black women. Our mission is to liberate black women from oppressive and toxic work environments, generate wealth owned and stewarded by us, for us, with a goal for our political and financial freedom. So a lot of times we do get to say we're bossy and I joke a little bit, but honestly, black women are the pillars of our community. And that's one of the reasons why I selected that group to invest in because 
I feel that black women birth this nation, but I feel we are the stewards of our community. We are the pillars. So we are often the knitting that holds community together, build relationships and steward cooperatives, nonprofits, things that move communities forward. So before we move on that point, I wanted to just say that. So we are bossy, but we often are the boss, the matriarchs and the pillars of our families and communities. You know, I said jokingly also, and at the same time, having lived through several relationships where I've, my partner was bossy, uh, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to live with unless, and I've, I've met some people like this that couples that they've learned these cooperative skills. How do you can mutually share in the decision making? Yes. Particularly when there's two bosses. I'm a bossy kind of person, too. I don't you know. It's been that way all my life. So, um, but how do you work together? How do you solve conflict together? How do you do it peacefully and fun and joy as opposed to clash, 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 clash? So, yes, I'm glad you came back and cleared that up. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, we're, we're not going to get into therapy yet. We're going we're, we're to say that for like the, the next 30 minutes. But um, you were asking me about oh, my career. So since my career started, I've always worked in arts and culture. Thank the Lord. I always have. From the time I started at Old Dominion University, um, when you have work study, my first position in college was I was the script librarian. So I worked in the theater school my first semester and no one came to get um, scripts, by the way. So I just was in there with the professors. And over time, my position grew. So the entire time I was in undergrad, I worked for the university in the theater department. And then I continued to stage manage. And that's how I learned about going to college, moving beyond just production to arts management and executive leadership for theaters, particularly because my background is theater, but in arts and culture. So that's how my trajectory went. And then my first professional career job was with a theater company called Cornerstone Theater Company which is based in Los Angeles, who makes plays with community. And they use art as a tool for social justice, which is what we are talking about today. Mm -hmm. And how I received that opportunity was my mentor, Leslie Tamara Bucci, who at the time was the co-director of the um, producing program at CalArts with Carol Bixler, um, had worked at Cornerstone. So one thing I'll say today is always have your network. She introduced me to Michael Garces, who was one of my early mentors, and um, I worked on a production at school, but then I had an opportunity to get an internship, then I got a fellowship and a job, and I will just say here I was awarded one of the Theater Communications Group Future Leader Fellowships. That was an $80,000 fellowship, so that one opportunity led to mm. those multiple things, so that was my first career job being a a producer, uh, associate producer for theater in Los Angeles with a social justice theater company. So that was my first big job. Fantastic. Fantastic. I worked at a theater in Cleveland a long time ago, but because I was a teacher and I was teaching middle school, my job was to work with the, with the young people there and try to keep them, you know, doing things and active. But that's a lot of fun. That was for my year. What did you do? What was your role? Like, what was well, 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 they had the, the young people coming in doing theater, okay? Mm -hmm. And my job was to help the students, like, with their homework or other things that they had to do or get them into sports or something so that they just, when they weren't on stage, they just weren't running around tearing up stuff or being in arguments or whatever. So, so have you some were the company manager. You were the company manager but for youth. So you were the company manager, which I've been a company manager. For adults, it's tend to get coffee and still make sure they don't tear their heads off. <laughs> okay. And drive them places. <laughs> okay. Uh, Caramu House was the name of that in, oh, in wow. Cleveland. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. And I taught math and middle school math and science so this was so different from my day job and i loved it and as you were talking about your 
career. I, I thought I came back to that, and I haven't talked about or thought about Caramel House in quite a long time. That was 1970. Well, that brings joy to you, though. Yes, it so does. Do you, do you do you like the age? So me, I t I like the littles, like five and under. I tend to teach Sunday school, and then I like college. So then you're like graduate school. So it's like five and under, or I guess nineteen and older. So which is the age group that you like teaching the most? College. I only taught the middle school one year. <laughs> okay. But I was only twenty one and twenty two, and. They were 14, 15, 16, and they tried me. They did all kinds of, they tried me. But, uh, and it was in a parochial school, so I got with the nun, and we worked out a strategy of, of how I could get them in a place where they could learn mathematics, and that's, that's what we did. I enjoyed it, but I never wanted to go back to middle school. No. That Thank was you. one time. It's like, you did it. It was good. I did it. I paid my service. I yeah. 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 And I've never thought about it even working with five and under that would be interesting because i love that group of people they they nice they're very i nice. love that group i love the littles i love the littles but now my son is nine eden um and he's not a little anymore but the five and under it's so much wonderment like in the eye like seeing people learn things for the first time i mean that's part of of my enterprise unlock creative i love to see people have an aha moment. And littles have an aha moment like 30 times a day. So you literally get to watch their eyes be big and discover the world. So I think that's why I love that. So any environment where I can see people go, oh, I, I love that part. I love that part. Well, that's what I got in math and science too. That that aha moment was the, was the reward. That was payment because it wasn't in dollars and cents. You didn't, didn't mm -hmm. get it in that. So it was a... When somebody got got it, and they knew they got it, yeah, that was that's phenomenal. Okay, so you've different from most people in that you went to school for the arts and you've been working in the arts. Uh, so many people go to school for X and they work in Y or A or Z or something, and it sounds like you get a lot of pleasure just as you're talking. The smile that's coming across, you get a lot of pleasure in studying the arts and working in the arts and getting other people involved in the arts. Is that right? Yes. So I am an animated person. Um, you get to see my smile, but I, I do find so much joy because we're all creative. So again, the enterprise is called Unlock Creative because most artists that I've ever met aren't one discipline. They're not just a theater artist or a music artist. And even ourselves, we have all different type of desires and hobbies. Um, so creative people I love because if you if you think about it, creative people, all they are, they're problem solvers. They solve for things. They communicate things in ways that multiple people can receive them. So I always have this um, on all my different type of things when I talk about myself. It's like I love creatives and creative things. I love colors. I love flowers. I love creativity in nature. I love creativity in people. And I think my personality is a character in itself, so I'm <laughs> creative um, um, in my way. But I do love those things. And I always was attracted to it. Being in that small town, I always was attracted. And I had my little life plan since I was 11. Uh -oh. And I did my life I did my life plan. I'm on a different chapter now. But it always was like exploring, you know, going to Hollywood, doing the things, seeing how those things work. They always intrigued me. And I think it's the wonderment of it. Like, I like wonderment. Oh. So I used to think because I was in math and science that I was not creative. But you are. Oh, I, I, I learned that. It's, and it is problem solving and it's different ways of solving problems no matter what they are. I've, it was in the business world that I really got that, that I'm quite creative, extremely creative. So... Uh, but I didn't play the piano or dance or do artwork, draw pictures or sculptures. So that's the world I saw as creative. And then eventually in the business world, I found out because I went back. I had a master's in mathematics and then I taught for a while. Then I went back and got an MBA and went into into corporate. And that's a lot of creativity, particularly dealing with uh, racist folks in a corporate environment. That's interesting you have to be creative you have to be creative all the time yeah yes 
And when I was in graduate school, um, we had to put together our portfolios and, of course, actors and scenic designers and all the different other uh, disciplines. You know, they would have these elaborate <laughs> things that they would show at portfolio review. But we had, you know, computer things <laughs> to be like, we do this. But what I always would put is organization is my art. And that is my most true art form is organizing ideas. And one of the things I think one of my um, colleagues, clients, friends, Liza Garza, who is a poet and artist, um, beautiful spirit. She helped me understand that I help translate what artists ideas so that lay people and business people can understand. So that's really my work to be in community with creatives, but translate that so they can, you know, get the capital they need, get the resources they need to translate that work. So I like to say I approach my work as a giant yes. How can we do this? A, gi How a giant what? Yes. Yes. A giant yes. A giant yes. If you, if I'm serving you, um, I always start the call. How are you doing? And what do you need in the world? Like as big as we can think, because I do believe any, our creator, what different people believe, studies show that when you name what you need in the world, it comes to you. So maybe it'll be for me, but even the belief for you to vocalize what you need, but it's enough voices in your head. It's enough naysayers. I don't need to be a no for people. I need to be a yes, yes. for people when you come a to me. A giant me. yes. A giant yes, and how can we do this? How can we do the thing that has been seated in your heart, given to you by your creator? How can we make that happen? Okay. I'm quite interested. First, I need you to tell us the difference between Unlock Creative and National Black Women Creative Cooperative. 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 Yes. Just, yeah. Tell me the difference okay. to those two businesses. Okay, so I'm going to introduce the Unlock Creative um, ecosystem. So okay. I am currently the steward of that and had lots of people along the way to support. So Unlock Creative Enterprises includes three entities. Unlock Creative Coaching and Management, LLC, which is a consulting firm that does arts business management for creatives and creative businesses in the arts and culture sector. And I said I started that to feed the baby. We okay. can come back. That, that pays the bills. Then we have Unlock Creative Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm where we offer these same services to primarily black and brown businesses that can't afford the services to give them high quality arts business management. And then the third entity that rounds it all off is the National Black Woman Creative Cooperative. So I own 100% the LLC. The nonprofit is a public entity, so it's publicly owned because it's a, it's a 501c3 um, nonprofit. The cooperative, every member who is a bought-in member of the cooperative owns this. So it is a mutually owned, we all have the same voice. So the more that the cooperative builds up, which I hope it builds up more today because you all are here with us, that we will own it. And moving forward, by 2030, we want to have a town that's our own Wakanda. So all the different people kind of who have engaged in multiple aspects of the ecosystem can show up in the town, that the town is a physical manifestation of the legacy that I would like to leave. So it would basically be like a creative co-op where you have um, – Arts, culture, people can have agriculture, we can um, have housing. That is really a town where, like, arts is thriving and black, black women are stewarding that. So those are the difference. So all the people, the hundreds, over 50 businesses, over 100 women who have passed through our programs, the idea is that they will filter in and wind up being owners or participants of the services in the National Black Woman Creative Cooperative. So they flow together in its mission, but they all have different levers that they pull and they all have ways to access capital in different ways, which is one of the things that black people, you know, we need to do is access capital in different ways. So that is the difference in the introduction to the three businesses and the difference between each of them. So tell me about Black Women Creative Cooperative, National Black Women Creative Cooperative. Why a cooperative? Where did you learn in your in your education? You're dealing with art. 
Old Dominion and California Institute of the Arts. You're studying arts. Is that where you found about co-ops where you were studying them? No, that is not where I found about co-ops. <laughs> At my PWI, I, um, well, I'm from North Carolina. So I think in the way that we work in both communities is very cooperative like my aunties watch me and my mama watch their kids and I watch the little kids so we work in a cooperative spirit but one of the things um, folks hear me talk about is reconstruction is my favorite period in in U.S. history because you know we have quite a we have a storied and can be bleak history but the reason I love reconstruction is because if you see all the amazing things that black people did coming out of that period it always excites me when you look at those statistics that with our freedom what we did but then details of cooperative so i knew about it in the spirit and 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 learning history which history is my favorite subject this book which you know you you told me you know this book collective courage a history of african-american cooperative economic thought and practice i was reading this book maybe a few months before I started the cooperative in 2020 and it just goes through the history and it just reminded me and I'm like cooperatives. I want to have a formal entity that's a cooperative. So I want to back up two beats after Cornerstone. I worked at an organization called Alternate Roots. They serve artist acts all throughout the South. Alternate Roots serves what now? Artists who are activists throughout the U.S. South. That's the whole mission. So many of the artists and collectives that were in that organization that I got to work with were cooperatives. They ran as collectives. They ran in this way. So that's where I really got to see the model of cooperatism, even if they weren't a formal entity, how they practice their work. So that is where I learned about it in practice. And when I decided I wanted to make an entity, I wanted one of my entities to be a legal cooperative because, as you you all know, y'all are everything cooperative. You um, you can't have every state doesn't have that. So I wanted that one of the entities to actually be a legal cooperative and not just in practice, because a lot of the organizations that I serve through alternate routes, they practice as a collective and a cooperative, but they were structurally either a LLC or a nonprofit. And you know that there are drawbacks without getting deep into that. So Mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to have a formal um, legal entity as a collective. And where did you incorporate your cooperative? What state? Uh, Colorado. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have some pretty good laws in Colorado. Okay. How many- and I have to shout out our lawyer, Lydia Edwards, who helped us. She is in Boston, um, but um, she is based in Jason Weiner. I have to shout out people who support us that wrote our bylaws. So if you need co-op support, hit us up. We can share that. So she's a black woman. And we were very intentional about wanting to have black women in every level of support. So she helped us write our bylaws. And all the women on the board are black women. So I just have to shout them out. And thank you so much, uh, Lydia, for your support and help. So is Lydia a cooperative attorney? Is that her main focus? Or is it just one of the things she does? It's one of the things that she does. So the firm, Jason Weiner. And if you go to our website, blackwomencreatives.org, you can see our sponsors. You can find the firm that we use to support us. And they have lots of initiatives where they support arts and social justice type organizations and collaboratives and cooperatives and B Corp. So they, that company does specialize in those type of things. And that's how I learned about them in my research through the field that they served other organizations that were similar to the one I wanted to build. So with reaching out to them and telling them my mission, they assigned Lydia as the um, legal attorney to be um, our attorney for the co-op to help build the bylaws and form it. Fantastic. Fantastic. How many members are in your cooperative? How many owners? So right now we have about 15. So you should come in on the ground floor, friend. (laughs) (laughs) I say that when it gets more, my goal was that there would be 100. But one of the things I know, and thank you so much for this opportunity, is 
um, translating and helping folks understand what the co-op is because it does so many things and in our community folks don't necessarily you know know why why a co-op what what are you doing so thank you for giving me this opportunity to better explain that so we have about 15 owner members right now and thank you um, to everyone that's a part of the co-op so if one wants to become an owner member, what should they do? How do they go to your web page, email, phone, whatever? How do they contact you? Yes. So go to blackwomencreatives.org. You can sign up um, for membership. Everything is on the website that sh- shows you the bylaws, why our co-op, all the services, what are the benefits, our vision, what we're building. So blackwomencreatives.org is where you will go and um because we're a small team, you'll get to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> B-L-A-C-K, women, W-O-M-E-N, creative, C-R-E-A-T-I-V-E dot O-R-G is the web page that they go to. And they- creatives with the S, black women, creatives dot O-R-G. Okay, that's why I wanted to spell it out, creatives. Okay, C-R-E-A-T-I-V-E-S dot O-R-G. Okay, so they could go there to find out about what this organization is and how they can get involved and contact you. Okay, yes. so you have 15 members. What are some of the art activities that these 15 members do? So I do want to note, just, just, just to clarify, so we have 15 owners, but we do have folks who are supporters and fans. So that network is probably 50. And then also we've had over 100 women graduate from our Creative Flower Sister Circle program who will who are in our community peripherally, who will probably be future members but who participate in our services. So to say what we do now, we are working. um, I'm going to give a little brief, a little bit, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Part of what we do together is support one another's businesses, support us with professional development with one another. And we have a partnership with a company called Just Works, because one of the reasons that women creatives don't do their art full time is because they don't have the benefits. So one of the ways that we are partnering with this company, which hopefully in the future we can partner with a black owned company. So if y'all out there, reach out to me that folks can have those benefits while they work their nine to five, they can have them within the co-op so they can do their business full time. So I will stop there because I know we're close to time. So black women cooperative, creative cooperative, you want to liberate black women from oppressive and toxic work environments, generate wealth where they own the business and their stewards for themselves to get a political and financial, to have a go of political and financial freedom. Sounds fascinating. Everybody out there, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to spend more time talking about the different ways that the National Black Women's Creative Cooperative does that, fulfills in their mission. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. And we're having a wonderful conversation with Ashley Walden this morning, who is the president and founder of the National Black Women's Creative Cooperative and the owner of Unlock Creative. Yes. A lot creative. Yes. So before we took the break, we were talking about the cooperative, and you were saying that there are 15 current members, and you have other people that are working that could become members. You want to have a go of 100 members. How does one become a member? So to become a member of the National Black Woman Creative Cooperative, you can go right now to blackwomencreatives.org. That's B L A C K W O. M E N creative C R E A T I V E S dot O R G. So black woman creatives dot O R G. And um, you can find out, we'll talk a little bit more about it here. All the information of what are the benefits, what are our services, and you have access, access to the bylaws, why we have the vision and what we are aiming to create, which the big goal is by 20, 
30 to have groundbreaking on a town that is our Wakanda stewarded by black women here. Uh, basically, uh, artists run black creative town. Did you know that Willie Nelson had a town? Oh, he did not know that, but I know there are lots of towns. So you, I learned something new today on the show. It's in uh, Texas. He had a town and it was quite interesting. Uh, so, yeah, we want a town, black women run it. So talk to me about the membership in terms of if I decided I wanted to be a member, if I had those skills, <laughs> art skills, if I was that creative, what would I would contact you? But what are the different memberships that it would are possible for me? Thank you. So we have four levels of membership, which is Sapphire, Emerald, Ruby, and Onyx. But the thing to know in the spirit of cooperativism, everyone votes counts the same. But the reason we have multiple tiers, it the multiple tiers more um, delegate where someone is in their career. So the Sapphire monthly membership is $25 a month or $300 a year. And that's for your individual black woman creative. They may, you know, they may still be in college. They're figuring it out. They just have an art firm. They may not even have a business yet. Our MLM membership is $50 a month and $600 a year. And that is targeted to someone who's a sole proprietor, a one member LLC. You have an operating budget in your business already, maybe up to $500,000 or you've been running your business less than 10 years. Then we move to Ruby membership, and that is $100 a month or $1,200 per year. And that's someone who's had 10 years plus of incorporation. They're operating 500 k to $1 million a year, like their business is already moving forward, and they don't fall into one of the other membership classes. And then this is where we go, where I want all my Onyx members to come out. If you listen to Onyx members, Onyx members are folks who want to invest in the cooperative um, 10K a year. Um, that's your investment. But again, all of our votes are there because when one rise, we all rise. So through our careers, the National Black Woman Creative Co-op will be a home for many women. So they may start when they're 18 as a sapphire, but by the time they're 40, 50, they'll be in that Onyx membership category so that it is mutualism and all, all the benefits we each get. So I'm going to talk a little bit about membership and then I'll, I'll pause. Okay, so I want to just ask you to get clarity on the Onyx. You said it's 10K per year? 10,000 per year. So these are folks, yes, 10,000 per year is their investment because these are folks whose businesses are probably already thriving. They're supporting um, the ecosystem um, within our co-op. They're at that higher level. They've been running their businesses. Or it's folks who say, you know, I'm not going to give sweat equity. I'm not going to come and do workshops. I'm going to give y'all 10K because I believe in this work and I want y'all to do it. That is those folks, our honest membership folks. Okay. All right. You were going to talk more about the memberships and the services? Yes, the memberships and the services. So, but pre-town, pre-groundbreaking, we are a virtual network and we are powered by the mighty networks. If y'all know that like an online platform uh, that you can use for community, but it's closed instead of some of the bigger <laughs> names you do, like a group that's on your whoever, I don't want to say their names, but we use the mighty networks, which is a closed community. So you have access to our membership directory. So it is our members who have all types of different businesses and creative structures opportunities. So if you are a person seeking jobs, you may be placed in a job that our members, our community has shared. And if you are a owner or you work at an organization, you can do job postings with us. Then we do have opportunities for professional development, which are ramping up, which could be anything from our financial literacy, which I want to shout out our accountant, um, Donna Carter, 
Carter Financial Services, who's accounted across Unlock Creative Enterprises and works with many of our clients, um, does financial literacy, offering with, you know, tax preparation. Some of this is just offering discounts to one another to work one on one. But we want to ramp that up. But then also we've had our members like Sarah, myself, do a mindfulness and meditation. So we're here for your full mind, body and soul to be well. So those are some of the perks of membership that is current in the future. I want to say why you want to get in on the ground floor with us is when we have the town, that town will be a retreat space that generates income. And my vision is all of us like one day, like in tears burning, I want to just be getting my check. Like I want to just be getting my check from the town running every month that that is our check that sustains our living from that. We are all owners of that cooperative, that retreat center where people come, that we are earning our income just from all the work, you know, the rentals, all those things that are happening in that space. And I know that we can get there and there are plenty of models and the women, the brilliant women that are already members work at organizations that do these things, but this will be our organization and we get the benefits and the profits to share when it is profitable. Have you decided which state? I've been looking at properties in um, Georgia, but it'll be in the South. I mean, I'm, I, my heart is in the South, so I, I want it to be a model, but that's our first town. And um, I want to sprinkle in a little bit that part of the idea is that we have this exchange with the U.S. and the continent. So we've already started to build partnerships with women on the continent, with Backyard Soiree, um, with uh, Natalie Magonja and with Prophetess Faith with Women of Authority in Zambia. So Zambia and Tanzania, but hopefully it's more. We want this cross-continent Black women in Africa and Black women in the U.S. South doing this work, this exchange together. So that's, that's where we are. So I do want it to be in the South. And also property is cheaper in the South. But mm-hmm. if we want it to be replicated. But I'm a, I'm a heart of the South. I want some land. I want some woods. I need, we, need, we need space. <laughs> and there are towns for sale for a million dollars. So also, if you're listening and you have a million dollars that you want to invest in black women, you can totally give it to us and you can donate that tax-free because we do have a nonprofit as well. So um, There's a town for sale for a million dollars? There are actually many towns for sale all over the country that are, yes. So isn't that interesting? Very yeah. interesting. It's very interesting. You can buy whole towns or co-ops, so like places that like, you know, multiple buildings and all of that. So if you want to invest, if you are a real estate agent, if you have someone who needs to donate land, who wants us to steward land, all those opportunities, please reach out to me. Ashley at unlockcreative.org, and you can follow us at blackwomencreatives.org. So, yes, we are open to all those opportunities, and they're there for the taking, Vernon. There for the giving. So what other co-ops are you working with? Are there other artist co-ops that you're working with? So the short answer is not deeply, because I have to say, Vernon, again, thank you. This is our first public interview talking about the co-op. So I've spent time since 2020 building the other businesses. But we do work closely with a lot of other artists and companies I want to lift up that work in the spirit of cooperatism. So one of the companies I want to lift up is Project South for the elimination of poverty and genocide. This was one of my primary partners when I worked at Alternate Roots. They're basically a sister organization that works on political action, social justice and change. So many of their members are cooperatives or work in that banner, like in in that similar vein. Um, Additionally, one of my close uh, collaborators um, and partners in organizations that I work with closely was called SIP Culture, which is the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production um, with the leaders, Carlton and Brandy Turner, who are my mentors. They have land in Mississippi and they do full cultural production. So they have agriculture that they steward. They have arts and culture programs, research, and it's all community based to uplift their community in Utica, Mississippi. So they are formally incorporated as a 501c3, but they operate in some of the values of cooperativism. 
So those are a couple of organizations that I would just like to uplift and highlight on the call today. So if you don't know about them, Project South and SIP Culture. I know about Project South. I donated to them once within the last three years. I, I learned about them through the Federation of Southern Co-ops. Yeah, see, I figured. Okay. I was going to say that. They definitely have a lot of members. I think they do more agriculture, that type of work that you say. Like, so I, I knew that there would be crossover there. So... Do you know Callie Akuno in Jackson, Mississippi? I don't, but I, my friends probably know them because they're so, amazing. Uh, he's the chief executive officer of Cooperation Jackson. They have three co-ops that are operating oh, right now. They have seven that they're working on, and and they're looking at arts. Oh, so he was on the first week of this of this month, Black History Month. I visited there. Now that you say that's one of the early co-ops I visited when I first worked at Alternate Roots, we had a staff retreat or board retreat at their offices. So I've been there. Okay. That's so long ago. I hadn't thought about that since you said that. And then there's a group in Pittsburgh, Ujama Collective, and that's ujamacollective.org, uh, black women artists. They make jewelry, paintings, clothing, and they have a storefront in Pittsburgh and a web page to, to sell their products and services. And I th think they would probably be a good partner for you. And last week we had a gentleman from Zeal, Z-E-A-L, which is a artist cooperative also. And I don't have his name right in front of me. But both uh, Kelly Akunu and the gentleman from Zeal you can find their Alan Fringpong, F R E M P O N G. They they I interview them the first and second week of this month, and they will be up on our webpage, everything dot co op, within the next week or two, as yours will be. Once uh, Pat Thornton, the producer, edits them, she takes out all the mistakes I make. You don't make any, but. Hey, <laughs> And then she'll put it up on the web and can give you um, a copy of it that you can you can um, send it out to your to your networks. You can send this interview out to your networks too. So I wanted to bring up I don't know if you know this organization. It's called Center for Cultural Innovation, but they have an ambitious program and that program so many of the people you just said, some of them, they they are grantees or investment projects that this organization um, has given. I, I have been an ambassador. I think I may still be on their website. So many of the organizations that you had told me about, they specifically support cooperatives. So the deep dive when I read that book is when I was engaged in working at that organization. So I wanted to share that and I can put it in our chat for you, but it's the ambitious um, Center for Cultural Innovation because many of those artists, they're all artist cooperatives. So I just wanted to make sure I shared oh. that. And many that you said are funders, like some of the ones you mentioned, they're, they're grantees of this program. Yeah, I would like to get information about them because finding you and Pat did her research, Pat Thornton did her research, we didn't have anybody two weeks before the month started because blacks and arts hasn't been something that we've we've looked at. So, yeah, I would like to get that somewhere. I read, I think it was the artist from Jamaica who said that if you ever want change, the change can only be made through music. Mm. Um, I don't think that's, I don't totally buy into that, but I do buy into art and artists are out there in front before change. Have, have you witnessed this also? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah, so learning about history, being in school, oftentimes you learn about when policy shifts, like the policy, the law. And again, I like history, but getting into the work of learning about, um, what is community organizing when people talked about hearts and minds? And I will tell you, it was the hardest concept for my academic brain uh, to wrap myself around. And actually, Project South is is where I learned this. And um, with one of our other mentors, Tafara Walla Muhammad, who is a 
a community organizer, so many other, like she taught me a lot. And watching her work, she's a member of Alternate Roots and um, Highlander Center. I don't know if you know Highlander Center, um, all, all that. So yes, art as a tool for social justice and also shifting hearts and minds. So I could not wrap my brain around like, what do you mean hearts and minds? What, like, what y'all saying that it, it does? But understanding that communities, any type of communities, churches, political institutions, even war propaganda uses art and culture to get ideas impressed upon us of what is socially acceptable or even maybe what we're pushing back on. But it gets in society first. There's no major law that has shifted in the U.S. that there was not some type of cultural component that was uplifting that from environmental we talked about it on our call we shall overcome freedom songs and i do feel like art even in school how we teach abcs people know their abcs because of the song like literally art teaches us our fundamentals in many different ways and then it's spread across our communities so that we are absorbing it and that we're having those ideas before typically the law, the policy, the rule change. And we've seen it in so many different um, movements, you know, like the Arab Spring, like um, the civil rights movements, arts and culture was always embedded. I, um, I remember the cartoons, the Jetsons. <laughs> and um, for, for those that may not know about it, it's, they were a futuristic community. They, their apartment was in the in the air and they their car would fly to their apartment and open the garage door that let them into their apartment the only thing that i haven't done that i wanted to do when i graduated from high school was to learn how to fly but the reason i wanted to learn how to fly was so i didn't want to wait until i was older and we were having cars that flew and mm -hmm. i would have to try to learn how to fly then, because I knew older people in Bluefield, West Virginia, a small town I grew up in, when they were old, they couldn't, it was very hard for them to learn how to drive. <laughs> so I didn't want to learn how to fly, wait till I was older. So it was interesting to me how these policy changes, but also the way that one can run their life based on things that they see. Now, I did learn how to scuba dive because of the the deep there was a movie there was a tv show about them going down to the bottom of the ocean and i wanted to see what was down there so i did learn how to scuba dive and go to the bottom the bottom of my ocean was maybe no more than 40 or 50 feet i didn't go that <laughs> far okay <laughs> but yeah it's amazing how the arts directs one's thinking and then creating policy change yeah, and just representation and being able to see yourself. Um, I talk about often one of my first black woman mentor is Shea Wafer, which we actually have a fellowship called the Shea Wafer Executive Management Fellowship um, for folks who are looking to get that nurturing. If you're a black woman, you want to be mentored by black women in arts and culture. Um, we have that fellowship, but I didn't get her to after going to grad school and she didn't even work at my grad school. My mentor sent me to her, but it took me that long. And I was going to a school that cost over a hundred thousand, whatever crazy amount of money hmm. a year. And it took me that long to have that representation. And that is one of the reasons why I work exists we want to shorten that even the fact that we can change like we can create our own futures. So there are people who spend a lot of time on shifting and tearing down the systems and people need to do that and I don't have an issue but my work is all on joy and envisioning what I want that's why the town I want us to vision and model the future we want I want to see us in the future living and thriving the way that we want to live infused and creative harmonious and the thing is innovation is just remembrance because many of our indigenous cultures including our cultures where we come from on the continent, we live this way. We've gotten away from it. So it's like we're innovating, but we're really not innovating anything new. We're doing going back to practices that were already sustained us. Well, you, you're saying what I've come to, to understand on this show, and we've been on for 10 years now. We're in our 11th year. Uh, and by the way, the National Corp Bank has been our sponsor that whole time. Okay. Yeah, the, the phenomenal partner. 
but going all the way back, if you go back to the tribes, uh, clans, uh, communities, whether they were in the desert or in Africa or here, everybody knew what everybody had to do. You had your job to do, and the community depended on you doing it, whether you were young or old or male or female or any, it just didn't make any difference. Everybody, and that's what cooperation is. How do we make decisions that's best for the group? That's the first and the primary piece. Second is what's best for you and your family, but it's what's best for the group. Is that why you decided to do a co-op? Or what other benefits did you want that the cooperative model offers you? Well, I do. I believe when one rise, we all rise. Like, I do believe that our ecosystem is a billion dollar ecosystem, but I don't want to be a billionaire, but I want our collective community to rise, our collective incomes in our community for black women and black families in the U.S. and on the continent to rise. But one of the things that I feel my gift is, is I can start things. I can start things and I can run things. And I feel that my creator gave me this in my heart to say do this but i don't plan on running it but i plan on starting it and that's a different skill set i i am organized i move things forward we will have land we will have a town it will get done so i know that is my gift so i want to be a benefit but also have a child and and my friends have children and i have family i want the world to be better but i don't just want the world to be better for like me and mine i want the world to be better for my community. And I don't think we talked about this, but I started Unlock Creative during the pandemic, after the George Floyd riots. I realized like I'm not someone that's going, you know, protest in the street. That wasn't my thing. But what I wanted to do was leverage all my talents and skills that I often had to use for other people's community. I wanted to invest them and throw them all into my community. What does it look like for the rest of my life to invest in the black community? And that's how I came with building power and wealth for black women creatives. But again, because we are the mothers of our community. So that goes to everyone. And this cooperative is that way. So if we have a billion dollar enterprise, all of us have that and we own that. That is a game changer, not for me to be ahead and be a billionaire, but for our community to have that and that's a shift that i would like to see so any hollywood celebrities all that all that web guy i would love for y'all to be an onyx member or beyond y'all can have buildings in the co-op named after you (laughs) all those things come on so this is fascinating what message would you like to leave people with believe believe if it's seated in your heart if it was placed there Don't sit on that idea. There are people who will support you. There are people who will support you. So just believe. That's the, if we just believe, have the audacity to believe in your goals and dreams. And I swear all these things I manifest in my brain, I see the receipt. So just believe, manifest, and, and speak out and write down. So I leave you with that vision and believe. If you can conceive it and believe it, you can achieve it. Yes, you can. Ashe, amen, <laughs> hallelujah, all the things. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for being on this show today. You, you just, just talking to you just in, enhances my energy level, and I really, really appreciate that. And I would like to see your, your town. I want to see your town. Don't see well, that you operation. have to be a guest. You have to be a guest because you're the first person to do a public spot on us. So thank you so much. Um, bless you. Thank you, Pat, um, for inviting us. And it is blackwomencreatives.org. Thank you so much for having me on today. You're so welcome. I thank you for blessing us. Everybody out there, please live cooperatively, and we'll see you next Thursday. <laughs>